Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And we hope you're enjoying the first morning of the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Um, my name is David Maza. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you today our panel, What does the Fox Say? Analytics in Poker. Our panelists are Bill Chen, who's a quantitative researcher at SIG Sports Analytics, Scott Blumstein, who's a professional poker player and winner of the 2017 World Series of Poker main event, Sonny Mehta, former director of hockey analytics at the New Jersey Devils and also former professional poker player, Maria Konnikova, author, contributing writer at the New Yorker and uh, ambassador at Poker Stars Team Pro, and our moderator, Nate Silver, uh, founder and editor-in-chief of 538. The panel will run for about 45 minutes, and we will leave 10 minutes in the end for audience Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question to our panelists, we ask that you please submit through Twitter using our hashtag, Poker Analytics. The tweets with the most uh, mentions will be chosen by the moderator. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nate. Cool, well, thank you all for coming. Um, I've probably been on like a panelist 12 or 15 times at Sloan. It's the first time I've moderated a panel, um, which ups the bar a lot for responsibility. I feel like I have an important job to do well by our four very illustrious pa panelists. Also, this is the first ever poker analytics panel, I believe, at Sloan, so I want to um, represent poker well. Poker is a, actually a pretty big part um, of my life story. Um, I was able in 2004 to quit my consulting job um, to do two, two things, one of which was write about baseball for baseball perspectives, but the other one was to play poker online. That's how I made my money. Um, and then in 2006, when Congress tried to ban online poker, that helped to spark my interest in politics, actually. So all the things I do now <laughs> have this flow through poker. Um, but in terms of ground rules, um, obviously we're at a sports analytics conference. I don't want to get into too much of a debate about whether poker is a sport per se or not. Um, I tend to think it is. It requires a lot of endurance, a lot of different physical and mostly mental skills. Um, but it's kind of beside the point. I, so I do want to um, but talk about poker for its own sake as well as make analogies between poker and sports. So especially Sonny, uh, who was on the hockey panel right after this, I want like lots of sports metaphors and analogies. You got it. But it's fine to be quite technical too. Um, you know, we have a very nerdy audience. Avoid, try to avoid using like too much jargon because poker players have their whole own vocabulary. But the concepts can be like fairly complex. We like to geek out on stuff. Um, so there are kind of three main subject headings that I want to talk through, one of which involves luck versus skill, which you experience in a very visceral way in poker. The second is um, the importance of game theory to poker and what's called GTO or game theory optimal play versus exploitive play, what that means, how you might analogize that to sports. And third is psychology versus math. Poker is a game that involves both. Um, you know, again, there are analogies there to a lot of sports, tennis, for example, and so I want to talk through that as well. So, but first I'm going to start with like kind of a, a background question for each of you, where you can kind of give us your like, your life story, or not your life story, but your kind of poker life story. Um, and I kind of, when I go in the order of when I believe that each of you started playing poker. So I think Bill is the, um, the first of the four of us to have begun playing poker professionally or seriously. In fact, Bill, you have tournament caches all the way going back to the 1990s. Um, so tell us more about what got you into the game, how you've seen it evolve, and kind of what you're doing now in the um, sports slash gambling space. All right, uh, I think that's a, that's a fair question. I started playing in the 90s because, you know, I went to graduate school in Berkeley in 92. Before that, I had been in Washington University in St. Louis, and I've been playing the kind of the poker games with the engineers there so I could get some beer money and grocery money. <laughs> but in Berkeley, poker was legal, so, um, you know, I started playing there, really got into it, um, really found a good group of people there. Um, you know, uh, I don't know if how many people know about the barge list, but that was when I started. And I was doing my math degree, and I worked for a, a startup. And you know, I was doing, I was doing poker, the startup, and my math PhD at the same time. Uh, it's not a, a, a great thing to do, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, uh, 
some of those things like partially succeeded. I got my PhD from Berkeley. Um, our startup was bought. Unfortunately, my stock options went to zero. <laughs> so <laughs> I was looking for another job. Susquehanna was just an opportunity and you know, it was founded by poker players and we have uh, like a great attitude of um, looking at everything in terms of uh, risk, expectations, and um, you know things things I was familiar with as a poker player. So I started there, and they were very generous in sending me to the World Series of Poker and just say, "Well, let's see how how, how you can do," <laughs> you know. Um, and in 2006, I got a little bit lucky, won two events there. Um, the limit hold'em, the uh, shorthanded no limit hold'em, and I've been I, I went back for the last ten years. Uh, for for ten years after that, I, I think I missed a couple of years. But you know, in 2006, after I won, um, I wrote a book with uh, Jared Ankerman, who also works at Sig. You know. Um, we started to describe kind of the um, game theory stuff that we looked at, and I think that has spawned a lot of the research and kind of GTO engines. But you know, I've been working for SIG all of this time, and just recently there was an opportunity to, like, a, just an opportunity I couldn't turn down, just to work in. Uh, SIG Sports Analytics, you know, and uh, we started a trading desk in Dublin, and our goal at SIG Sports uh, is basically uh, kind of twofold. We, we want to be a big part of the market, you know, betting in-game in, -game in uh, American sports. Uh, we want to take advantage of the U.S. Um, um, opportunity, but we're basically liquidity providers. So we uh, want to provide as much liquidity as people want. So if you know anybody that uh, want to make, uh, <laughs> wants to like hedge risk or uh, make a reasonable bet on a team winning a particular game or the <laughs> world championships, you know, call us. We're, we're, we, we really believe in analytics. We really believe we can price this these things and you know we can take uh, these big bets and that, that's what I've and, been working on. And poker has evolved a lot like now so much of the discourse is about game theory optimal play and balancing your range and like but you know as someone who kind of came of age in the um, early mid 2000s and kind of um, has rediscovered poker recently it is impressive how much the discourse has changed toward that topic. Um, Sonny you are someone who uh, I used to uh, uh, banter with on the two plus two forums a lot yes. um, when I was Nate the Great and you were Coltrane, I think. Yep, that's right. <laughs> um, but tell me about kind of your poker story because like a lot of people on the panel, I think like almost all of us, like you always been mixing poker with other things, including being a professional jazz musician. Um, yeah. But tell me more about when you started playing poker and why and, and what those games were like. So I guess I started playing probably around 2003 and uh, I was living in New Orleans. I was a as you said, I was a jazz musician, and I just kind of started playing poker uh, for fun, had an act for it, and I think the timing was just really great. I mean, I'm sure as, it was kind of the same time as you, so as you can attest to, I think, you know, that, that inflection point of Chris Moneymaker winning the World Series was just, like, really, really big for poker. Yeah, there were a lot of, there were a lot of bad players. A lot of them. I mean, yeah. have you, do you think games are a lot, uh, two questions, do you think the games are a lot tougher now, or do you yes. think that's exaggerated? I think they are tougher now. Yeah. I mean, granted, so, you know, as you know, I haven't played a lot in the last uh, five, six years, but uh, a little more in the last year, and I definitely think the games are much tougher compared to when we first started, you know. Um, I think that's really what it was. Like, I w it's not that I was really great when I started. I just think I was nine months ahead of everybody else when, you know, when it, poker got big. But uh, yeah, so I ended up playing actually for a living from 2004 till 2011 and wrote to poker books. And um, hockey was always my sport growing up. I played in high school and I thought there was opportunity to apply the same type of reasoning to hockey analytics. I mean, do you, because the timing is, do you draw a connection between like the sports analytics boom and the poker boom or is that just a coincidence? I totally think they coincide. I mean, Moneyball, yeah. you know, 
the, the first sort of wave of that was right around that same time yeah. when Moneymaker won. Um, and so I guess I was definitely captivated by both movements and thought there was opportunity in hockey specifically. And so um, I started, I ended up consulting for a uh, hockey team in 2011 and you know, befriended the owner or prospective owner and he recruited me to come to Chicago in 2011 to be an options trader. So I traded options from 2011 to 14, and then um, you know the Devils had been recently purchased, and the ownership group there wanted to start a full-time analytics department. So they reached out to me and uh, started with the Devils in 14, and was there until about a year ago. Um, Scott, you are, I think, the youngest panelist, although maybe not the most recent to start playing poker yeah. seriously. Um, so how did you come to poker? I mean, you, did you grow up like watching uh, the World Series? So yeah, I distinctly remember um, being a young kid and watching that whole money maker thing on TV. And I'm pretty sure that's when I first kind of fell in love with poker and um, always played as a- It's an emergency. Style. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, Bill. Um, so yeah, and I, uh, so I started playing poker and then all throughout middle school and then even in high school, um, I was like a sophomore playing with all the seniors and got my butt kicked a lot, but yeah. uh, you know, it was a good learning experience and then went to Temple University in Philly, graduated with an accounting degree and basically it was like, I don't uh, really want to Toilet emergency. Um, so <laughs> uh, I don't really want to become an accountant, you know? So yeah, I yeah. just was like, let's give this poker thing a shot. So I just kind of, uh, grinded for a couple years, had a couple, you know, moderate scores online, paid the bills, and uh, finally got my first breakthrough uh, the summer of 2016 at the Brigada for uh, $200,000 in, in a poker tournament. So I remember, I remember having a distinct conversation with my father before I left. He was like, I think it's time to probably get a job soon. You know, yeah. things not going so great. And I'm like, <laughs> I kind of agree. You know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm close. You know, give me, give me like a couple more tries. Yeah. And then went down to Atlantic City, uh, had that, that first breakthrough, and that kind of solidified uh, what I was doing. And then uh, a year later, went out to Vegas, uh, finally played the main event, the, first, you know, the tournament that every poker player dreams of playing and took my shot and uh, ended up winning it. So <laughs> pretty. Uh, so it was your first main event? Yeah, first time I ever played it. Yep, yep. So just, uh, yeah, pr pretty, pretty wild experience. And uh, that's, that's basically my poker story. And did you feel like, we'll talk more about the World Series in the next set of questions, right? Did you feel like you're kind of living this own made for television story when it happens or yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, definitely a, a, a dream like sequence of events, but that's what I always talk about. You know, when you're, uh, you know, if you're an athlete, right, you, you, you're in high school, you know you're good and then you get recruited to a big college and then there's a couple years of college and then you like eventually get drafted and you know you're gonna get drafted. But this was just like, you know, you, can, you could say you're a professional poker player without a lot of success and then uh, you go out, you, pay the, the money that anyone can pay, and then two weeks later, it, uh, your life changes in the blink of an eye. So it's a pretty cool uh, experience, and, and only poker can really create that. Because that is, you can't like go and um, enter the US Open and play against Phil Mickelson or whatever, right? But you can like enter the World Series of Poker and play and win, potentially. Yeah. Um, so Maria, you're someone who had achieved a lot of success in other walks of life, um, and you began playing poker more seriously as part of a book project that you were doing. Um, so tell us more about, about that, why you decided um, to, to make this your kind of next book project and how spectacularly well it has gone. Um, so one of the themes that you, that you brought up for the panel, skill versus chance, um, was something that I've been interested in for a long time. So I, my career has been as a journalist um, and I've been at The New Yorker for a number of years and uh, got my PhD in psychology, studied decision making, um, and studied the illusion of control. So when we feel we're in control, when we're not actually in control. So that happens a lot in environments that are risky, that are uncertain, um, where you don't really know how much chance there is there, noisy environments. And so I became really interested in this question of skill versus chance. Um, how much of our lives do we control? Can we learn to tell the difference between what's skill and what's chance? Can we learn to make the most of the times when 
it's chance when it, we're not in control. And can we learn to maximize our skill in those moments when we have that opportunity? Um, and I was looking for a way into that topic for my next book and decided that I was going to learn how to play poker. So, you know, you have Scott's story where he distinctly remembers watching poker on TV. I distinctly remember not knowing how many cards are in a <laughs> card deck. <laughs> that's, that's where I started. But I got incredibly lucky in that one of the best players um, in the world, Eric Seidel, agreed to coach me and to take me on as part of this book project. Um, and for him, and this goes to another theme of your conversation, it was also this test of math versus psychology. He started in the 80s, and his approach is very highly psychological. So can he take someone like me with a background in psychology, with a background in journalism, and turn me into a winning poker player? Um, and if he can, that's a proof of concept. That's a proof that, yes, there's all this GTO stuff, there's all this math, but I'm someone who took my last math class in high school. Um, and so if I can do it, it means that you can still kind of have something of an edge with the psychology. It ended up going really well. Um, I ended up um, making a lot of money um, quickly and winning some major titles. Um, and then when I won the PCA National Championship, um, I became sponsored by PokerStars. So I joined PokerStars Team Pro last year. Um, and so now I'm playing full time. I'm still working on my book. Um, it's called The Biggest Bluff, and hopefully <laughs> it will be out next year. Um, so yeah, I do want to talk about like luck versus skill um, in a little bit more detail now. I mean, for me, I don't think there's any experience quite like being a poker player for, for forcing you to kind of experience what the long run of skill and luck looks like, where you actually experience that one in 100 run of success, or the one in 100 time when your opponent gets runner runner cards to beat you in a big pot. Um, you know, so if you're looking at, at politics or looking at sports, I mean, sports people also deal with a lot of variance and randomness. In politics, people are really dumb about it. People don't have any idea like <laughs> what it means to have significant sample size, what it means to have a probability. But sports, we're at least on the spectrum toward understanding. But, um, but Scott, let me go back to you first. So it's kind of a two-part question. <clears throat> um, first, how did your brain kind of even wrap its head around like beating 7,200 other people. I mean, Maria and I actually went to a tournament last week in Philadelphia, yeah. and there were, I think, 88 entrants, and I got second, which was good. And I'm like, wow, man, second out of 88. And you're first out of 7,200, right? Which is two orders of magnitude bigger than that. Yeah. Like, just talk about how you thought through that and what that was like kind of during and, and, and afterward. And second, I know you've also, we've talked a little bit about how in poker, one thing you can do is vary how you play to change the amount of risk that you're taking on. And you are a believer in being a little bit more conservative at the start of tournaments. So talk to me about, about both those things. Sure, yeah. I mean, 7,200 entrance for a poker tournament is quite rare. Um, and that's why like the main event is, is obviously just unlike any other tournament in the world that you can play. And um, to be honest, I mean, I think the best thing, the best way to beat 7,200 people is to not really think about how many people are in the tournament, uh, you know, cliche, but just kind of like take it one hand at a time. And, uh, you know, it's a seven, it's seven days of poker before you even get to the final table. So um, that's a long time. So you can't really look too far ahead into the future. Um, but, you know, there's only eight other people at your table and that's really what's uh, relevant. So just trying to make the best decisions and, uh, you know, I think once you finally get to that like seventh day and you see, you look and you know, you start in this big Amazon room with, you know, hundreds of tables and all of a sudden you look around and there's three left and everyone else is gone for the summer and uh, that's when it kind of hits you that, you know, you're, you're still one of the final 27 left, so. Um, did, it, did it happen fast or did it feel like you've been playing for months? Uh, man, it's the whole thing, I, I really like, don't really, I wasn't really like conscious to the whole, you know, cause it's, yeah. it, it's, it's you know, just to focus so hard on everything. I don't really remember too much about what actually happened, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, I, I think, I think once you get down to that point, that was really the wake up call uh, to, to being, to beating that many, that many other people were already out kind of thing. So, um, but then as far as my overall strategy goes, yeah, I think uh, specifically in the main event. Um, so the blinds go up every two hours in that tournament where Throughout the rest of the year, uh, any other tournament you can play in, the, 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 the second best option you have is like an hour uh, level. So it's twice as good of a structure as any other tournament. So 
Uh, knowing that going into it and just kind of you know, generalizing my strategy, I decided to take an approach that I think a lot of people uh, really never practice in poker. And uh, I just tried to like reduce variance even more so than players already do. You know, there's, there's definitely like this thing in tournament poker where people will take these smaller edges and, you know, flip situations like, you know, ace king is a really good hand, but uh, at the end of the day, if someone's putting in more chips with you, they probably have a really good hand too. And, you know, sure it's doing well. So I just kind of like applied this concept where, uh, you know, I just wanted to see as many flops and turns and rivers, get as much information as I could, uh, even keep the pot smaller. And, uh, you know, I think in this specific tournament, because you could be so patient, uh, that's kind of what I credit, uh, you know, giving myself a chance to, to win. Um, and the, the irony is that uh, with, with two tables left, I kind of abandoned that strategy a little yeah. bit and did something really <laughs> crazy and super high variance. And, uh, you know, I, I always look back at that moment because that, that's how I used to play. So it kind of like I relapsed a little bit, I would say, <laughs> uh, when, when, it, when it mattered. But luckily, a couple hands later, uh, I doubled right back up and got those chips back that I had given away. And uh, from that point on, I think I wrote, wrote the ship and uh, played, got back to my strategy. and. Uh, you know, just finish the job. So basically, that's uh, the concept. By the way, that's a great achievement. What? <laughs> winning out, winning the main oh, event. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, yeah, thank you. I mean, that's yeah. that's grueling. Seven days. Yes, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Getting your concentration up. Terrific. Thanks. Uh, Sonny, you're fairly anti-tournament. I think I can say that. <laughs> you much yeah, prefer cash I think games. That's fair. Um, how would you compare? I mean, first of all, the variance is a little bit different in cash games, right? It's, you're not going for the big score as much, but Definitely. how would you compare the amount of luck in poker to hockey? Because I know I talk to you about hockey, um, and I would get frustrated by like how much randomness there was in hockey, especially the way the league is structured now with a fairly strict salary cap. So, so how would you compare the amount of luck in uh, poker versus hockey in particular, and how did that help prepare you for your career as a hockey analyst? I think they're really similar. In fact, if anything, there might be more luck in hockey in a lot of ways than there is in poker. Um, you know, to your point about luck versus skill, it's, I mean, that's why poker is such a great teaching tool for so many other things. It's like, you know, the way you're supposed to get better at poker is by, you know, approaching it as, let me try to figure out what are the things that I can control and get better at and work really, really hard on them. And I need to know in advance that the results are not gonna reflect that. They're not gonna correlate 100% to that. You know, there's, there's chance and that's gonna influence the results. So, you know, you just have to be aware of what you can focus on and get better at and control and what you can't. And um, I don't know, I guess I feel like that's a bit more obvious when you watch people betting on cards and a little less obvious and tougher to tell hockey players that, you know, sometimes the, the puck hits the post and if it had gone, you know, an inch the other way, it would have been a goal and it would have totally changed the outcome of the game. Well, you get a little philosophical here, right? Where in poker you think of like cards as being strictly random. I mean, in some sense they're not exactly random, like technically the dealer is shuffling, right? It's just like it's yeah. too hard to actually track the cards, right? But like, but Maria, I mean, this kind of dovetails right with what you are, yeah. are writing about and have written about, but like the whole notion of like the illusion of control, how can a poker player put that into practice, number one? And for you, you're kind of the subject of your own experiment, yeah. right? Like, how do you find yourself adapting to that? And are there times when you fall yourself falling for certain like logical fallacies, or are you actually pretty able to to think through it rationally and that helps you a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, the beauty of logical fallacies, which is why, you know, Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for them, is that no matter how long you study them, you still fall for them because that's the way the human mind works. Um, so, of course, I fall for them. If I were to say right now that I make decisions perfectly rationally at the poker table and away from it, I'd be lying. And that would be actually overconfidence, one of the logical fallacy sins. Um, but I think that what poker is so incredibly good at is it does force you to think probabilistically. And to, I think, and this is crucial, this is kind of what you were talking about, to be able to divide the decision process from the decision outcome. So you need to sit there, and like I said, my math background is minimal, but poker math is not complicated. You need to figure out, okay, you know, this is 
given kind of what has happened, I am probably like a 42% favorite in this particular situation or an X percent favorite. And you have like a range, right? Because you never know exactly what favorite you are because you don't see people's cards, which is why poker is such a good place to learn because in life you never see anyone else's cards. Life is also a game of incomplete information. Yes. But you make the best decision you can based on the information you have. You know that your decision process is sound and then you let the cards come. And if you end up losing, you don't care about the outcome of the hand. You do care because you're in the hand and it hurts, but you shouldn't. So for instance, one of the things that my coach often tells me is I don't care what happened. I don't care if you won the hand or not. Where was the problem in your decision? So it's never important, did I win or lose? Oh, what did the other guy have? Was it a correct, was it a correct call theoretically? Mm -hmm. Was I a favorite? And the thing is, it's still, from a psychological point of view, it's still horrible. I remember this one moment, and this, this I think illustrates it for me, was um, during the World Series, during one of the bracelet events, um, not during the main event, and it was the stone cold bubble, which means that the next person who is out of the tournament gets zero dollars, and then the person after that, and this was a big bubble, the person after that, I think, was getting you know, maybe $10,000, something like that. And so we were playing and playing, and finally I ended up getting all of the money in. It was a very, very long bubble with Ace Jack and the other person who called me turned over Ace Jack. We had identical hands, um, and I ended up bubbling because he made a flush. And so you, and so you, you sit there and you say, oh, that's what 1% feels like. And then I remember walking out and everyone's clapping because everyone's so excited they're in the money. And I'm like, guys, stop clapping. Wait till I'm out of the room. <laughs> they're all clapping. And I run into this guy who's a really good, very famous tournament high stakes player. And he's like, oh, you know, what just happened? And I told him, he's like, well, statistically speaking, you couldn't have gotten your money in any better. And I said, you know, just be quiet. I don't want to hear that right now. <laughs> and that's the reality versus the theory. Um. So I want to move out now on talking about uh, GTO, game theory, optimal play versus exploitable play, and I'm going to throw it a bill in a moment. I'll give my somewhat amateurish notion of what GTO play means, um, which means in a poker context, it means that you're playing your entire range of hands in a balanced way that can't be exploited. Um, it involves having the right ratio of bluffs to value hands in any given spot. Um, and somewhere in there, there's an idea that you can actually solve no limit hold'em, or at least slightly limited versions of no limit hold'em. Um, so conversely, exploitive play means you're trying to make the right play in the moment, that maybe, for example, you have an opponent who um, folds too often, therefore you're bluffing more often than you should, quote unquote. Um, but it also means that people can counter adjust and be, um, and exploit you too. So Bill, first of all, uh, you literally kind of wrote the book on game theory and poker, so tell me how badly I butchered that? No, that, okay. was, that was right. The, uh, <laughs> uh, optimal play is uh, playing such that you win the most or lose the least if you tell y your opponent, oh, I'm, you, you know, with this hand, I'm betting 33% of the time, checking 33 and uh, raise, you, you know. Because it can be like. Check calling uh, the other 33% of the time, you know. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's a way you can play such that you win the most or lose the least in a particular situation, even if your opponent knows what you're doing. And what's it been like seeing, because like you literally will now get to a poker tournament where people will have their apps that tell you when you are at a certain amount of blinds what your GTO range to, to go all in with is, right? And like literally you can like be taking the app out. Some casinos don't like it, but most are fine with it, right? And be using the app in between hands, and I'll do it sometimes, right? And I don't care if people are looking because it's it's, GTO play is not exploitable, so they can know I'm playing this way over my range of hands. But what's it been like to have written this book, what was it, 2007? Yeah, 2006, I believe. Six. Yeah. So you wrote this book and now you see it be the center of all this poker discussion. I mean, what's it like seeing it play out in practice and what things about GTO play are harder in practice than they are in theory? Well, first of all, I'd like to say it's only like true kind of GTO if it starts heads up play, like you're playing heads up limit hold'em or heads up no limit or any game. Then you can say, I'm gonna play this uh, GTO, game theory optimal strategy, and the best my opponent can do is break even with me if they also play correctly. Um, and you know, that's, that's one form of GTO and 
it then becomes just a math problem. It's a big math problem with a lot of nodes, but you could, if you're playing heads up in a poker game, you can kind of design an optimal strategy for limit hold'em and, you know, a no limit hold'em, and eventually um, you can get to a perfect strategy. I mean, um, you know, Moore's Law, computers are gonna be more and more powerful. <laughs> There's no real reason to doubt that any game we have now, computers are going to be more powerful. Um, you know, uh, algorithms are going to be more powerful. We're, we're just going to have game three optimal kind of heads up eventually. Uh, in multi-way game, it's not clear that there's a game theory optimal strategy for, for all games. Uh, like, there's situations where two people can choose a strategy and you can't win, and so on and so forth. So I would say uh, GTO, if you, you want to play heads-up game, you can solve it. In other contexts, it's more like uh, you get heads-up after a flop. You have a range of hands, and they have a range of hands, and you're trying to play, like, partial GTO there. But, I mean, uh, I, I think that um, there's always going to be like poker that's not specifically heads up, that you're going to have to use a lot of judgment. And Scott, Scott would you call yourself a GTO player or not? And are, have you, how much experience have you had using solver programs, and how good do you think those are? So these are programs now where it'll actually say in an increasingly complex array of situations what it thinks the right range of hands to play is. Right. So, do you so think those are much good, or do they leave things to be desired? So for $1,000, you can buy this program now called PO Solver. And basically, you run it overnight on some sort of PC. And um, you, you have to like pick specific scenarios. You know, It's not going to just tell you how to beat the game, like Bill said. But you can pick a situation, and it'll compute everything and basically tell you how you should play exactly and then that's what the best players in the world are using at the highest stakes these days um, as a tool to uh, just get better and uh, personally I don't use that uh, I haven't really needed it luckily um, <laughs> I, I play uh, I probably play more in the exploitative side I'm big into yeah. the psychology aspect as well yeah. but um, you know again like you obviously need to know the math and and uh, you know situational stuff like that but but I definitely think there's a massive mental parts of the game and um, you had mentioned Snapshot, which uh, Max Silver, another professional poker player, created. And uh, ir ironically, with uh, I think I, I knocked him out of the, the, the main <laughs> event I won in like 54th place or whatever when I raised and he went all in. And I was like, I think, I'm, I think he probably plays based off his app. So I had a good idea <laughs> of right. you know, what he was doing. So uh, that, was, that was pretty fortunate. And, uh, but yeah, no, those, those tools are, are certainly there. And, and that's why I really haven't ventured into the higher stake stuff is because I know these uh, got, these people are using this technology that... I mean, it feels a little bit like the critique people make of, uh, I don't know if Daryl's here, how the Houston Rockets play, right? Yep. We're, like, we're like, it's a really good strategy when some shots are worth three points and some shots are worth two points, take a lot of shots that are worth three points, right? Yeah. And you watch these tournaments, and like, there's a certain point in time at which, like, at which it becomes kind of an all-in fest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it's right. You know, I've, I play this little home game. It's like a $20 buy-in, right? It's really badly structured, right? So you're always really shallow. Right. And for years, I would like try to play the game well because I'm like, I'm trying to three people and like show that I play well after the flop, right? Yeah. And got like pretty bad results, and I'm like, I'm just gonna be like a, a shoving like donk basically, and like it works really well, and I almost always cash now, right? And so, so it's really hard to beat. The, well, the, the, the point I was going to make is that if everybody has less than 10 big blinds, sure, you can look at all your tables, the yeah. one to shove and the call. Right. But if somebody had, if nine people at the table started like 50 big blinds, there's no way, that, there's no like game theory solution there yet. You still have to like use your brains and uh, like figure out how people are playing. There, there, there's no like computer solution you can have for that. So, you know. Uh, Sonny, so you were in games where you're playing the same opponents for years in New Orleans. Yeah. Although there's a lot of tourists in New Orleans too. Um, <laughs> but I want to talk about like the notion of like of having a personal style for how you play. Because one thing is like if you make certain adjustments relative to the theoretical optimal style, then everything else has to change too, right? If, for example, um, you know, if, as an example, as a former limit player, if I tend to when we debate hands, right, you probably say that I would overvalue certain medium strength hands. But in theory, you can like adopt a strategy around that, right? And like counter just, so what's it mean to like, first of all, what's your style? And secondly, um, where do you stand on kind of the GTO versus exploitative debate in the kind of games you've played in practice? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it just comes down to like, you're rarely, I mean, 
in the games I was playing in, when I was playing cash games for a living for seven years, I mean, the point is to make money. You want to play against players worse than you. Yeah. Um, so in practice, you know, I think it's I think it's really helpful to sort of like talk through what like optimal theory would say in specific situations. I mean, you know, you and I do that all the time, but it's really rare that you ever play exactly like that because it's usually more profitable to do something else. You know, I mean, for years in New Orleans, I was playing against players who just made so many fundamental mistakes in certain areas that just recognizing what those mistakes were and counteracting them was really profitable. And you don't feel like when you do something exploitative that like you're somehow like um, you owe debt, you know what I mean? Like I feel like if I play a hand in an exploitative way that like I did something bad and like it's gonna catch up with me and I have like negative karma from that, I don't know. You shouldn't play no. poker then. I never, yeah, I, never, I never felt like that, I never felt like that. Um, Maria, I'm gonna kind of combine because we're running a little short yeah. on time the next two questions because they're kind of yeah. similar anyway. Um, so first of all, from talking with you, um, it seems like a lot of what you try to do is figure out what makes people play poker badly, especially what makes um, men play poker badly, um, and exploit that. But you also have a pretty solid understanding now of GTO play. So talk about, number one, um, how, you, how you balance those, and number two, kind of like um, how the psychology that you study in, like, in an abstract concept comes to life on the poker table. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that that's a very fair assessment of how I play. So I do think it's very important to understand the GTO strategy, especially because at higher stakes people are playing that way. So I do use PO Solver and I do run those simulations and I do try to figure out, you know, how am I supposed to be playing? But it's also to account for my lack of experience because for a lot of people, they've actually been kind of running PO Solver, not really, but they've been seeing a lot of these options over time because they've played hundreds of thousands of hands, people who started online back when online poker was legal in the United States, everywhere. And now you have to go to New Jersey, and now you, know, now you, have, to, you have to make certain adjustments. But they, they had that experience, which I don't have. And what PO Solver does for me is it plays thousands of hands for me and comes to a conclusion about how I should behave in certain spots. And so I use it that way, and I use it to understand how, you know, when I encounter some of the best players in the world at my table, how they're thinking. And that's actually, that drives me to psychology. You need to understand how everyone else is thinking if you're going to outthink them. And if you can figure out, oh, I'm actually at a table of players who all play GTO, well, it becomes a, a question of saying, okay, you know, how do I, how do I exploit that now? How do I actually play differently? How do I play either tighter or more loosely? How do I know that Max Silver is shoving using snap shove? And then, so I can either tighten up or loosen up my shoving, calling, whatever range accordingly. And because I think that GTO play is never about max profit, that's not its point. It's about losing the least yeah. um, in, in any situation. But I think tournaments are about profiting. And so I try to use my background in psychology to figure out you know, what types of mistakes do people make under certain circumstances? What happens when you become emotional? If I can figure out, so some people become really aggressive when they become emotional. Some people become really timid when they become emotional. What I try to do is observe them and figure out for you personally, this is not going to be something that I can say about people in general. For you personally, how do you see yourself, what happens in those situations. Because the thing about poker is, no matter how stone-faced you are, no matter how well you think you control yourself, once you've been playing for 12 hours for seven days, you are exhausted, your resources are depleted, and all of your biases are gonna come out. And if you think they won't, then I've got some news for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bill, conversely, you come at this from the most kind of abstract mathematical background. Um, would you say poker is essentially a mathematical game? If you had to like put a number on it, then what's the ratio of math to, to psychology? I think it really differs from player to player. Like, I'm actually, you know, uh, as you said, like stronger in the math area. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, I'm a little bit like sometimes afraid to go with my read in that, yeah. oh, I think this guy is weak this hand or this guy is particularly uh, playing really tight, you know. Uh, for, for me is, uh, what I do is I mostly try to play 
kind of the, I would say either the optimal or what I think the correct strategy and only deviate once in a, once in a while, like on the marginal hands. So for me, it's like the basis is 80% math, but I think it really differs from player to player. So I'm not gonna. It also differs on the game too. Yeah. Totally. yeah. You know, yeah. I think you have a you know, limit hold them versus no limit hold them or just like two different beasts and you know, no limit hold them, you can, you can get creative and you know, limit hold them, you're confined to just betting one unit. Uh, so it's tough to like really do much with that, so. No, as a former limit player who most plays no limit, I still feel so much freer at yeah. no limit, right? There's so much more options to do different things. I mean, but like, right. but so let me try and frame it a slightly different way. If you took a player who had only played online, um, let's say they were a very skilled online tournament pro and sat them down in the World Series Poker main event with $10,000 buy-in, again, they get the math part of it really well, would they be a favorite to make money in the first time they've ever played live poker? So that actually happened a lot because you think about the online poker boom and then uh, there was guys that made a lot of money coming up through the online streets and then they would venture into the live arena and there was live pros too at the time, you know, some of the more well-known guys mostly played live and they definitely struggled at first. Like there was, there was a, an adjustment period, uh, probably just nerves in general and and then, yeah, like the idea that they couldn't hide behind their computer screen anymore. They had to yeah. actually be a person in, uh, you know, function society, I think uh, probably, <laughs> probably got to them a little bit. So it's definitely an adjustment. And I always consider myself more of a live player. I think, yeah. I think if, when you care more about the psychological trying to exploit uh, aspect, sitting at a table with the other people is uh, important and helpful. So, uh, you know, online was, for a while there was this other software uh, called a, a hood, a heads up display. And that's what a lot of the pros used, you know, talk about analytics. This kind of told you everything you need to know. It had, uh, you know, how often the, your opponents were three bet, you know, all these statistics. And then you could kind of exploit and make adjustments based off just pure numbers where live, you don't have that. So uh, live, you have to just kind of look at your opponents and see if, you know, make decisions based on how they, who they are. and. Although you can, like, I'm a dork, so I actually will sometimes, like, track how many hands people are playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but most people well, don't do that. Uh, that's, that's a good strategy. <laughs> Sonny, how often are you making decisions based on what poker players sometimes call feel? Um, where you're like, my intuition is that this player is, is stronger than you would think or weaker than you would think from the kind of mathematical range of hands that they should be playing. You know, to, to follow up on what these guys were saying, I think it really just depends on the game and who the, who the player is, you know? I mean, if you're playing in a medium stakes uh, cash game against weak players, um, you're gonna play a certain way. And if you're, you know, playing in a tournament with a much shorter stack against really good players and, the, you know, maybe the, the money bubble's close, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it just depends, you know? I mean, do you find like when you're like, oh, that guy does seem like he's unusually strong and you follow that intuition, For do sure. you find that you're usually right or? Uh, usually being like more than 50%, yeah, but usually being like 90%, no. Yeah. I mean, you know, you never, that's well, the thing. probably what you were saying, where people react different, like some people will react in a stressful way and show obvious stress responses if they have a big hand, yeah. right? Because you're like, I have aces in a big pot, right? Yeah. And like, yeah. For sure, no, and you never know, and that's the thing. And this is the thing about statistics, you need a large sample size. That's why also your HUD displays aren't always accurate because you need to have thousands of hands with one person. Yeah. Otherwise, you might say, oh my God, this person is an aggressive maniac, and it ends up that they've just been getting pocket aces and pocket kings for the last, you know, 20 minutes, and you don't know that because it's never gone to, uh, to showdown. So I think that, it's really, really important to try to realize that you're limited in your observations and that you need to just play to the best of your abilities. This is back on what you can and can't control. Um, and what you can control is how you react yourself. You can also look at how other people are reacting and say, uh-oh, I don't want to do that. Um, and you can control you know, how you play against certain people. So Nate and I can't play the same strategy because we look different. And people are going to think that we play differently because they just, you know, I'm female. I sit down at the table. That's the first thing anyone sees. And you might think that women are the best players in the world, the best, worst players in the world, or you might not have an opinion, and yet you're still going to play differently against Scott, against Sonny, against Bill. Any one of us sitting down at the table is going to elicit different responses and strategies. And I think it's our goal as live players 
to account for that, to figure out what those responses are, to play accordingly, and to have the statistics in the background to have kind of a fallback strategy for this is what I should be doing. And you see, like, you know, as a 41-year-old white guy, people play differently against me than when I used to play a lot back in the mid-2000s, right? As a 29 or 30-year-old white guy, right? A lot of different assumptions people make. Well, one thing about online play is, like, if we're going to be data-driven, there is going to be a lot of data in your hand. So, uh, you know, when I used to play online, um, I would look at my stats the most because I didn't want to be, you know, exploitable. Right. So that, that, yeah. that's one thing. We're all data-driven. It, it is funny if you do track your own stats like I do when I'm, when I'm playing live. Um, I'll do it, like, kind of two hours at a time, right? You'll see, like, you will have periods where you're the tightest player at the table and the loosest just based on, it's like, you know, especially live, it's like a pretty small sample. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few audience questions that I want to ask. I think they're... Um, you guys can fight over these questions if you want. Um, but so one question is, does poker being your main source of income change your strategy at all? I think people here have all gone through periods where poker is a major source of income for them, periods where it's not necessarily. How much are you thinking about, like, um, you know, how is this decision actually affecting my, my life choices in the near future as my income? It did for me a lot, I can say that, you know. Um, we were talking about this last night. Um, I think particularly like where it had an influence was just like uh, bankroll management, you know, choosing which games to play in. Um, you know, I think all poker players would say that once you're at the table, you shouldn't let that sort of thing affect you because then, you know, you shouldn't be playing in that game. You should always be playing to maximize your EV, basically, your expected value. Um, but I think, and this is where I think a lot of poker players struggle is because they don't necessarily exercise good bankroll management. Um, but when you're doing it for a living, to, s to some extent, you don't really have a choice. Like, you know, if you, if you just go on a cold streak for a couple weeks, you have to, you know, and you were maybe planning on taking a shot in a bigger game, and you say, well, my rent is due on the, on the first, and maybe that wouldn't be such a smart idea. I think it... So overall, it's easier if you can kind of, I mean, if you control for the fact that you have much less experience, when you can come in and say, now I have an income from other sources and I can go in and, like, and play a tournament, it's a big advantage, right? Definitely. Yeah. I think the two most important, the two most underrated and important skills of being a professional poker player are bankroll management and game selection. I don't think yeah. it's much more difficult than that, right? Like, just play with people you're better than and, and understand that there's variance, like, you can definitely, despite how good you are, there's going to be variance, and especially, you know, the, 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 the worse the structure, the, 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 you know the different the, the how deep you are big blinds wise all these things factor in and you just have to be smart about these things if you want to be successful and it's part of the gto thing too right is kind of figuring out like when I'm, I'm being honest about myself saying that i'm not better than my opponent and therefore i'm going to default to gto to lose the least right yeah, for sure yeah but you're also you know a pretty smart guy a lot is this the thing about poker it's like it's tough because a lot of people don't Think like that, you know. There's definitely a lot of people making major mistakes and in, um, in, in all these aspects. Sometimes you don't get a choice in tournaments. Like, right. I was heads up with a guy named Phil Ivy. He won, <laughs> <laughs> but it was very, it was pretty intimidating. And like, I'm like, well, I'm gonna stick to GTO because I'm not gonna go into the I think he thinks. I'm not gonna win at that game. <laughs> yeah. <You know>. Um. <laughs> So this question, in live games, how much do you calculate odds on the fly versus intuition? Obviously, every poker player knows the base, like what is a chance of like a flush coming or whatever. Um, but how often do you guys get in situations where you explicitly try to calculate a range of hands for your opponents and take, take several minutes to do that versus just being like, oh, it's close enough, I'm gonna kind of guesstimate? Well, when I'm in a really big spot um, and, it's, and it's a marginal spot and I have to either call off for my tournament life or be in a situation where like this is this is a significant decision i will actually take the time and if it's a, if it's a tournament with um with time banks i'll take time banks at that point and i will actually try to go through the entire hand um, in my head and i don't calculate odds i calculate combinations you know how many value combinations am i beating um, if any how many bluffs could he possibly have you know, what am I losing to? What am I beating? And is one bigger than the other? And at the end of the day, um, I'm only going to be doing this if it's a close spot. And so if I'm beating more than I'm losing to, I'm going to call. And you have to be willing to do that, even if it's going to hurt. 
um, if, you're, if you're already taking the time to go through that calculus in your head. Um, some people do it knowing that they're already calling or folding. And then I, you, know, you can kind of do that to, uh, I, I guess, bolster your initial intuition. But normally you, you don't need to do that. And I think that's actually a very good lesson for life decision making that you don't always have to go through these complicated calculations because most of the time it doesn't matter that much. You can get a ballpark close enough, like yeah. I think I'm good like over 50% of the time here, my odds are, you know, my odds are correct, I'm calling. But if it's a very important life decision, just like if it's a very important tournament poker decision, then actually take the time to think, am I beating, you know, am I beating anything that you'd be that you'd be value betting? Am I beating your bluffs? Like, wh what's happening? So let me ask another question that's kind of inspired by that, right? So, um, you know, if Sunny and I are playing poker and we come back from a tournament, we'll discuss hands, and invariably we pick like the really marginal spots, right? Like, Definitely. should I have continuation bet with ace jack on this queen high flop or whatever that turned into a big pot for some reason, right? <laughs> um, and they're usually close decisions where it doesn't matter that much either way. How do you go about finding the decisions that you take for granted that are big leaks and big holes, things that you don't necessarily even realize you're doing wrong. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, it's like, I, that's, because there's a fine line between some of these decisions sometimes. Like when you have spe specifically ace jack on queen yeah. xx, you know, you could check back or you could bet, right? Both options seem pretty good. And sometimes I think a lot of people wrestle too much with these things and sit there and debate because both are probably fine plays and then you're just like, you know, the one time, the guy had a queen and so he called and then you, you know, then you, so it's, it's, it's tough because then you start questioning. So, I mean, it's definitely finding the balance between like not being results oriented, but like also kind of understanding that you're trying to win and, and, mm -hmm. and accumulate money. So it's definitely a hard balance, but um, at the end of the day, yeah, as long as you are trying to fix those leaks uh, that are, that are apparent and big, um, I think you'll be all right. Yeah, I think you want to think about the decisions enough to make sure that the decision is at least close. Yeah. Like, I think poker, say, unlike chess, is one of these things where it's forgiving of small mistakes, and then you make the great play or a mm -hmm. terrific read that, that wins you the big pot. You want to make sure that if it's an ace-jack decision that you have a reasonable range of hands for your opponents. And if it's close, it's close, it's not gonna cost you much. Yeah, you know, that's and that's actually one of my favorite uses of PO Solver. When I have a decision like that, I'm just gonna give it to PO Solver and tell, have PO Solver yeah. tell me what the optimal strategy is for that. And then I'll say, oh, okay, you know, I bet here, and I'm supposed to bet, you know, 30% of the time, I didn't do anything horrible. Or maybe PO Solver will tell me, actually you check this 90% of the time, and then I'll say, uh-oh, like, is, right. this, is this something that's actually problematic? So in my mind, that's actually one of the best uses of a solver. But you trust the solver? Because there are some things well, that have some developments in modern poker player that I feel like are weird, right? There's a trend now called down betting where you'll bet like a very yep. small amount. Yep. Sure. Yes. Uh, well, into a large pot. And like to me, it feels yeah. like doing that in position is pretty weird. But like it's very fashionable. And it, it seems it like works. the solver programs like it. <laughs> yeah. But it works. Up, but like that's why I'm getting like to counter adjustments, right? The counter yeah. adjustment is I yeah. should like be check raising a lot mm -hmm. and I'll, call I'll let you know when people are starting to do that. It hasn't <laughs> yeah. happened yet, but uh, we're, we're, we're waiting for that day. But I mean, do you guys think that like, cause poker in 2019 is like really different than it was in 2006 or even than it was in like 2012 or something if you watch the World Series of Poker then, right? Or 2018. <laughs> yeah, or 2018. <laughs> yeah. Do you think in 2025 that it'll look totally different or do you actually think that we have reached with solver programs and a larger theoretical understanding now, and now more than a decade since the poker boom? Or do you think we've kind of reached the point of diminishing returns? I think it's gonna keep evolving because the thing about solvers is solvers will only give you the output that's equivalent to your input, right? So I can run the exact same hand as Scott, right. um, and as Sunny, and as Bill, and as you, and we might get actually different solutions because we had different assumptions going in. We plugged in different ranges of hands. We gave the solver different branches of the game tree. I gave my solver the, op the option of, be of betting a quarter pot. Your smallest bet was a third pot. Yeah. So you have to realize that your output is based on those assumptions. And so I think that the game is gonna keep evolving because it is dynamic, because game theory is dynamic. Yeah. And so as people, as you start making it an option for people to like check raise, you know, to, to respond very differently in these spots, then 
the strategy is going to change. And I don't think we're anywhere near solving No Limit Hold'em for multiplayers. Right. And there's also going to be evolution in terms of like the games played in 2025. Like, uh, I mean, maybe No Limit will be still really popular, but you know, Pot Limit Omaha, some of the mixed games, some of the triple draw games we're playing, Badugi, all those games will evolve. And when they first come up, uh, there won't be any solutions or solvers or programs that you can play, <laughs> have. Do you think, the, we have about a minute left, uh, do you think, I mean, so there's a critique, for example, in the NBA that oh, all teams now play the same way, which I'm not sure I really agree with, right? Do you think now poker players, there's less variance in how good players play? Because to me, one of the wonderful things about poker is that you have people with very different backgrounds, different skill sets, and fairly different styles, and they all kind of work. Do you think we're at a point now where you have to play a certain way, or is there room for, for variation? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think with the PO solvers that we're headed towards, I do think that there's a general strategy you need to kind of have now. Uh, we're back in the day when it first started. Nobody knew what they were doing. Everyone was just, so it, I think it's kind of gotten to the point now where, you know, fundamentals are kind of set in stone. So once you have those, um, then you can maybe go another way from that. But yeah, I think you need to have good fundamentals and then, um, Basically, as long as you have some kind of logic and reasoning for what you're doing, um, and, it, and, it, and it's profitable, then so yeah. So I think we're like kind of there per se, but and yet people are still people. So you yeah. can understand GTO on the computer and know how you're going to play, and then you're going to break down or crack because your mental game is not as strong as someone else's mental game. So I think as the fundamentals become more yeah. ingrained and people become better players, those psychological edges are actually going to matter much more. Yeah, and every time I sit down at a table, the table composition is always different. Yeah. So you, you always have to figure out a different, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm going to quit when I play with like eight perfect robots. <laughs> but, and, and like you don't. I mean, there's still a lot of bad players and the bad yep. players, I don't know if the bad players are as bad as they were before. But there are lots of bad poker players still, so rest assured. It's a hard game. <laughs> it's a, it's, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a hard game. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, you know, and, and, and that's why I think if you can simplify it as much as that's what I try to do is just simplify it for myself and try to make the most of it. And it's a bit like these debates about like, oh, how much has like baseball evolved or whatever, right? Like obviously if you took a baseball player from today and put him back in the 1950s, even a mediocre player could probably kick ass, right? Yeah. But like we have so many more advantages today and you can use solver programs now it's easier to get coaching than before, um, you know, to benefit from the discussions like this one that people have had over many years, so we all gain from that. Um, but that's all the time we have, so thank you very much for attending the first ever poker panel here at Sloan, and thank you to the panelists.